Good evening. It's Wednesday, November 3rd. Democrats lose the governorship of the state of Virginia as a neophyte becomes the first Republican to win a statewide race there in 10 years. Democratic Governor Phil Murphy hangs on by a slim margin in New Jersey. Republicans and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell celebrating victory in the first electoral contest of the Biden presidency. Last night was a difficult evening for Democrats. The Democratic Party has wildly misread their mandate and let the radical left run the country. House Democrats add a new paid family leave program, immigrant work permits, and a state and local tax break to President Biden's one and three quarter trillion dollar social services and climate change bill. Reviving key priorities in the rush to finish up and start voting after the overnight election results. For the fourth time this year, Republicans in the Senate used their filibuster to block consideration of a voting rights bill. So I hope that today we're going to rise above partisanship. Let's do what's right for our democracy. But Republicans ignore that plea from Vermont's Patrick Leahy. Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski becomes the first to break with her party and vote to allow consideration of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Citing no incidents of election fraud, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis today pledges to create a law enforcement agency to investigate election crimes as part of a new state package of voting laws at the World Climate Conference in Scotland, Britain's government claims that the end of coal is in sight after 18 countries, including Poland, Vietnam, and Chile, commit for the first time to phase out and not build or invest in new coal power. And several Supreme Court justices appear concerned that a broad ruling in favor of gun rights could threaten restrictions on firearms in subways, bars, stadiums, and other places where the public gas. The court hears arguments in its biggest gun case in more than a decade, a dispute of whether New York's restrictive gun permit law violates the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. California, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Rhode Island all have similar laws that could be wiped out by a ruling from the court. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the evening. Evening news. I'm Mark Miracle. Democratic Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey narrowly won re-election in his reliably blue state, while a Republican political newcomer delivered a stunning upset in the Virginia governor's race, sending a warning today to Democrats that their grip on power in Washington may be in peril. In Virginia, Glenn Youngkin became the first Republican to win statewide office in a dozen years, tapping into culture war fights over schools and race to unite former President Donald Trump's most fervent supporters with enough suburban voters to notch a victory. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, Murphy barely eked out a victory against GOP challenger Jack Ciatrelli, who mounted a surprisingly strong campaign on issues including taxes and opposition to pandemic mask and vaccination mandates. The two states' results were particularly alarming to Democrats because of where they happened. President Joe Biden carried Virginia by 10 points last year. He took New Jersey by by more than 15. Given the scale of those victories, neither state was seen as especially competitive when this year's campaigns began. But the first major elections of Biden's presidency suggested growing discontent among voters, an issue Biden himself addressed at the White House. People are upset and uncertain about a lot of things, from COVID to school to jobs to a whole range of things and the cost of the, the a gallon of gasoline. And so if I'm able to pass signing the law, my Build Back Better initiative, 
I'm in a position where you're going to see a lot of those things ameliorated. Meanwhile, Republicans were celebrating, if not almost gloating, like Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Last night was a difficult evening for Democrats. The Democratic Party has wildly misread their mandate and let the radical left run the country. Local Democrats let teachers unions keep schools shut months longer than necessary and told parents they didn't get a say in what their kids are learning. Washington Democrats have supercharged inflation, recreated welfare without work requirements, and made America significantly less energy independent. President Biden was only given a 50-50 Senate and a tiny majority in the House, but he decided to let the radical left run the country. Citizens wanted a return to normalcy, but have gotten a never-ending series of government-created crises. So look, the American people will not stand for this. In Virginia, businessman Glenn Youngkin, a political neophyte, was able to take advantage of apparent apathy among core Democratic voters, fatigued by years of elections that were seen as must-wins, as well as growing frustration with Biden and the economy. Youngkin has successfully portrayed Terry McAuliffe, a former Virginia governor, Democratic National Committee chair, and close friend of Bill and Hillary Clinton, as part of an elite class of politicians. Youngkin also managed to appeal to the Trump Republican base while keeping Trump himself at arm's length and never campaigning with him. He tapped into culture war fights over schools and race. Polls showed the race tightening after Democrat McAuliffe said during a late September debate that he didn't think, quote, parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That prompted Youngkin to run hundreds of TV ads on the statement and to focus on his own pledges to make school curricula less, quote, un-American and to overhaul policies on transgender students and school bathrooms. The race took an especially bitter turn last week when Youngkin ran an ad featuring a mother and Republican activist who eight years ago led an effort to ban Beloved, the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel by African-American Nobel laureate Toni Morrison from Classrooms. In his victory speech last night, Youngkin again highlighted the issue of schools and curriculum. We're going to start with 20 charter schools and we are going to make a down payment and close the gap on giving parents an opportunity to select where their kids go to school. Friends, we're going to embrace our parents, not ignore them. We're going to press forward with a curriculum that includes listening to parents' input, a curriculum. Lawrence Rosenthal is the director of the Center for Right-Wing Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He told Philip Muldery, host of KBFA Sunday Show, that the right-wing attack on school boards across the country can be traced back to an uprising against high school curricula at a West Virginia school nearly 50 years ago. It was a Kanawha County, West Virginia, and uh, there was an uprising in 1974 against the adoption of uh, school literature that that people thought uh, pr- pr- uh, uh, promoted anti-American sentiments. They, they these sentiments were against what would come to be called. Uh, multiculturalism and also um, feminist uh, feminist ideas in these books. Uh, one uh, stu- student of, of the right in this country called Carol Mason wrote that um, let me let me stop for a second and say these these protests 
wound up in um, uh, violence and bombings and um, uh, and boycotts. Uh, Carol Mason wrote that the tactics of the Kanawha coalition of the coalition building would become the script that the right would follow for decades to come. So there's there, this is this is that kind of uh, school board um, uh, mobilization brought into the age of Trump, the age of white replacement theory, and. Um, and there's one other thing about school boards which is interesting or you know important in this is that there aren't a lot of um other occasions for what you would call um kind of open mic possibilities so that um this kind of expression of grievance is has has long been and continues to be particularly compelling at the school board level because um it's accessible so at the in this moment, in the post, in the Trump era, in the post George Floyd era, which is to say, the era in which, if you remember, George, the the, the immediately after the the murder of George Floyd, um, there were at the level of uh, American corporations, the New York Stock Exchange stopped for nine minutes. Uh, people began talking about systemic racism in a way that actually was quite amazing, uh, as though this phrase, which one heard in academic circles and in and somewhat on the left, suddenly became uh, used by uh, American Express <laughs> um, airlines. Um, the the the. Um, uh, and and major sports uh, institutions, and the reaction to that, the reaction to the George Floyd um, demonstrations and so forth, brought forth um, things like the Proud Boys becoming prominent in national politics. Um, there's the famous uh, shout out from from uh, Donald Trump in his in his uh, debate with Joe Biden um, in the, during the presidential campaign, in which he was sort of giving marching orders to the Proud Boys, but the Proud Boys appeared on the streets um, to quote unquote protect. Uh, it, uh, you know, storefronts and things like that from the um, uh, George Floyd demonstrations. But this rise of conversation about systemic racism, the rise of things like the New York Times 1619 project has uh, brought forth this um, reaction, and the reaction is part and parcel of um, the same motivation, the, the white replacement theory motivation that gave us January 6th. Lawrence Rosenthal, lead researcher at and director of the Center for Right-Wing Studies at UC Berkeley and author of Empire of Resentment, Populism's Toxic Embrace of Nationalism. The mayor's race in Buffalo, New York yesterday put India Walton, a Democratic Socialist, in a rematch with four-term incumbent mayor Byron Brown, the city's first black mayor and a Democrat who lost the primary to Walton this summer. Brown ran a write-in campaign and won with 59% of the vote. Mary Sherman reports on other notable municipal races. In New York City, Democrat Eric Adams celebrated his win. There's a covenant between government and the people of our city. You pay your taxes, we deliver your tax dollars through goods and services. We have failed to provide those goods and services. January 1st, that stops. 
Democrat Ed Ganey will become the first black mayor of Pittsburgh. In Miami, Mayor Francis Suarez won a second term with nearly 80% of the vote. And Boston will have its first female and first Asian American mayor, Democrat Michelle Wu. What we deserve is a Boston where all of us are seen, heard, treasured, and valued. A Boston for everyone. In the aftermath of the mass protests against police violence, voters in Minneapolis rejected a ballot initiative to replace the city's police department with a new Department of Public Safety. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacific Network and Public News Service. Despite the defeat of the Minneapolis Police Charter Amendment, efforts for police accountability and best practices continue to take shape in Minnesota. Mike Moen reports. The question before Minneapolis voters was whether the police force should be replaced with a Department of Public Safety that emphasizes a public health approach. Pastor Janae Bates of Yes for Minneapolis, the group behind the Charter Amendment, says aside from the vote, the debate has propelled important discussions about how policing should look in the future. She feels the scope needs to be much bigger. To really tap into the fact that policing is just one part of a public safety system and that people across the country actually deserve to have their needs met. Bates says some still wrongly assume a public safety department would result in no law enforcement. Other reform advocates in Minneapolis worry recent violence will get worse if the department goes through big changes. In Rochester and Burnsville, police say they're listening more to marginalized communities and training for better responses in calls involving mental distress. Burnsville Police Captain Matt Smith says despite what people might assume, there are some in law enforcement who want substantive changes. He points to his department creating a behavioral health unit this past year with part of the goal to avoid conflicts with officers. We've always known that we're not the best trained mental health providers. And a lot of times we would respond to the same person over and over and we'd hit roadblocks. And to bring in professionals who that's that's what they're trained in to work alongside us just seem like a natural fit. As for building trust with BIPOC residents, he says they're enhancing outreach, including more meetups in public settings like city parks, where residents feel comfortable talking with officers. Rochester Police Training Lieutenant Paul Grunholt says his department has emphasized crisis intervention training for more than a decade. He adds they're focusing more on hiring officers of color in hopes of establishing trust. Without the authority from the community, police, uh, we can't do our jobs. Mike Moen, Minnesota News Connection. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. House Democrats added a new paid family leave program, immigrant work permits, and a state and local tax break to President Joe Biden's one and three quarter trillion dollar social services and climate change bill today, reviving key priorities in the rush to finish up and start voting after overnight election results. The House Rules Committee convened late this afternoon to consider the updated text of the now sprawling 2,100-page package, a crucial step ahead of initial House votes that are possible as soon as tomorrow. The flurry of last-minute additions on top of a plan to include lower Medicare prescription drug prices comes as Democrats are desperate to deliver on Biden's signature domestic proposals after disappointing election results for the party in Virginia. A warning that their grip on power could be in peril in next year's midterm elections. Most voters in Virginia said drawn-out negotiations in Washington over Biden's governing was a factor in their vote. So blame was flowing to Capitol Hill as Democrats have spent months arguing over details of the package. Democrats have been working feverishly to shelve their differences, particularly with holdout senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and launch votes on Biden's big bill and a related $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package that has stalled. The family leave provision that Senator Manchin had resisted earlier is expected to include four weeks of paid time off for childbirth, recovery from major illness, or caring for family members, less than the 12-week program once envisioned, but all fully paid for with revenue from elsewhere. 
Biden had reluctantly dropped a scaled-back paid leave proposal from last week's White House framework after Manchin balked at the cost. But Democrats who lobbied that paid leave has been a party priority for decades continued to push it. Representative Richard Neal, Democrat of Massachusetts, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, said the paid leave program came together after talks early today with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Arizona Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallo told CNN it's a very popular program. I think a lot of us have been saying the and have had the same feeling and and the idea that we're going to negotiate um, uh, among ourselves because of what one senator or two senators want uh, just doesn't make any sense. There's a process for them to deal with what they don't like. I think the sentiment we have here is that the bill has been marinated. It's time for us to put it in the oven and let's get going. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer took to the Senate floor this morning to push the new agreement on prescription drug pricing that would lead to lower costs. Democrats had reached an agreement to include provisions in Build Back Better that will lower prescription drug prices for seniors and for American families. This is a big deal. For years, skyrocketing costs of prescription drugs have plagued millions of seniors and American families. To the point that Americans spend far more on prescription drugs per capita than other wealthy nations. The agreement would allow Medicare to negotiate prices for certain costly medications. That would benefit not only Medicare recipients, but anyone else who uses those medications. There would be a $2,000 annual cap on out-of-pocket medication expenditures for Medicare recipients. The price of insulin, for example, would drop from $600 a month to $35 a month. The agreement gives the drug companies nine years, in some cases 12, to charge high prices for their new drugs before their medications would be subject to negotiations. On another remaining issue, the Democrats compromised on a plan partly to do away with the $10,000 limit on state and local tax deductions that particularly hits New York, California, and other high tax states and was enacted as part of the Trump era 2017 tax reduction plan for big corporations and the wealthy. While repeal of the so-called salt deduction cap is a priority for several northeastern state lawmakers, progressives wanted to prevent the super wealthy from benefiting. Under the plan, the 10000 deduction cap would be lifted to $72,000 for 10 years, starting with the 2021 tax year. And the just-added immigration provision would create a new program for some 7 million immigrants who are in the country without legal standing, allowing them to apply for permits to work and travel in the U.S. for five years. It would also allow the government to tap unused visas to admit people into the U.S., Resolving the immigration issue was among the last daunting challenges to finishing up the draft of Biden's package. Biden had set aside $100 billion to fund immigration changes, which could bolster the overall package from one and three quarters trillion dollars to $1.85 trillion if the provision is accepted by the Senate. Those involved said lawmakers plan to make their case to the Senate parliamentarian in coming days. Hopeful the immigration changes will pass muster under Senate rules because they build on existing programs. The Build Back Better reconciliation bill currently being considered among the Democrats would increase penalties on companies that violate labor laws and unions are pressing for its passage. Suzanne Potter has that story. The bill would impose civil penalties of up to $100,000 for certain violations and make directors and officers personally liable. Anthony Testa is a shop steward for the Communication Workers of America Local 9510 in Orange County. He says some companies become abusive when workers try to organize. We've had workers that have wanted to form a union, but were subjected to companies making disparaging comments, bringing people into separate meetings, trying to basically discourage them or intimidate them into not joining a union. 
Opponents say the changes would be a burden on business and cost jobs. Labor groups are big supporters of the PRO Act, which passed the U.S. House in March but is stalled in the Senate. That bill would make it a violation of the National Labor Relations Act to require employees to attend so-called captive audience meetings, to permanently replace strikers, to lock out employees prior to a strike, or to misclassify certain workers as non-employees. Dan Maurer with the Communications Workers of America says right now companies often just get a slap on the wrist for violations and workers continue to suffer. If we want to rebuild the labor movement and in turn rebuild the middle class, we've got to make sure that those issues get corrected. The PRO Act would also make it a labor law violation to discriminate against an employee who has offered unconditionally to return to work after a strike. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. Executives of the John Deere Corporation say the company won't return to the bargaining table with its striking workers because it won't offer them a better contract than the one they rejected that included immediate 10% raises. Mark Housie, the chief administrative officer of Deer & Company, said today the deal with the United Auto Workers Union, the one that they rejected yesterday, represented the most it could offer and still keep its costs competitive. The vote on the contract was much closer than when 90% of the workers rejected the company's first office offered last month, but 55% of the workers still voted against it. Pressure on the union to reach an agreement will mount to the longer workers go without pay. The disputed contract would cover more than 10,000 deer workers at 12 facilities in Iowa, Illinois, and Kansas who make the company's iconic John Deere green tractors and other equipment. Deere officials predict the company will report record profits of between $5.7 and $5.9 billion this fiscal year. Amazon has begun to pay about $62 million to its drivers after it kept their tips for two years. The Federal Trade Commission had found that Amazon did not pass on tips to drivers, even though it promised clients and drivers that it would do so. The FTC said Amazon didn't stop taking the tips until 2019 when the company found out about the FTC investigation. The drivers were part of Amazon's Flex business, which was founded in 2015 and allows people to deliver Amazon packages with their own cars. The drivers are independent workers, and they're not considered to be Amazon employees. The FTC said Amazon at first promised them that they would be paid $18 to $25 an hour, it also told them they would receive 100% of the tips given to them by customers on the app. But in 2016, Amazon started paying drivers a lower hourly rate and used the tips to make up the difference. Amazon did not disclose that change to its drivers. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock. You can find all the newscasts archived online at kpfa.org. President Biden and other world leaders have returned home from the COP26 International Climate Summit in Glasgow, Scotland, leaving details to be hammered out by their negotiators. One of the key issues is helping to finance poorer countries in their adaptation to the effects of climate change and their transition to a greener future. The rich countries failed to follow through on their previous commitment for a $100 million annual climate fund that was supposed to begin last year. The British Treasury Chief Rishi Sunak said the UK government is providing fresh funds to help poor countries cope with climate change. Over the next five years, we will deliver a total of $500 billion of investment to the countries that need it most. And we can do more today. I can announce that the United Kingdom will commit £100 million to the Task Force on Access to Climate Finance, making it quicker and easier for developing countries to access the finance they need. And we're supporting a new capital markets mechanism which will issue billions of new green bonds here in the UK 
to fund renewable energy in developing countries. But Sunak said public financing isn't enough. He called on the world's financial industry to channel its vast funds toward greener investments. So far, the industry has been slow to respond. President Biden issued an executive order earlier this year aimed at requiring companies to disclose climate-related financial risks. Britain gov- Britain's government today claimed that the end of coal is in sight after 18 countries, including Poland, Vietnam, and Chile, committed for the first time to phase out and not build or invest in new coal power. The statement issued late today during the U.N. Climate Summit in Glasgow said more than 40 nations are committing to ending all investment in new coal power generation domestically and internationally, as well as to rapidly scale up clean power generation. Participating nations also commit to phasing out coal power in the 2030s for major economies and 2040s for smaller ones. Separately, the statement also said that Chile and Singapore have joined a UK-led alliance on phasing out coal that includes over 150 countries and businesses such as HSBC and NetWest Bank. Oakland Congresswoman Barbara Lee says the U.S. military is the single largest institutional source of greenhouse gas emissions on the planet and should reduce its emission levels. Lee has introduced a resolution calling on the Defense Department to set clear annual emission reduction targets in line with the global goals in their 2015 Paris Agreement and the National Defense Authorization Act, which approved a record $768 billion in military spending. Lee notes that the U.S. military is estimated to emit more CO2 than over 120 separate countries and would rank 47th out of 170 if measured as a separate country. Lee's calls for the Defense Department to commit to strict, transparent, and independently verified reporting of greenhouse gas emissions from both domestic and overseas operations, from military contractors, and from the manufacture and transfer of military equipment and weapons. Endorsing organizations include Friends of the Earth, Food and Water Watch, Veterans for Peace, and Code Pink. The chair of the House Oversight Committee issuing subpoenas to top executives of ExxonMobil, Chevron, and other oil giants, charging that the companies have not turned over documents needed by the committee to investigate allegations that the oil industry concealed evidence and lied about the dangers of global warming for decades. California Governor Gavin Newsom canceled his plans to travel to the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow, but a contingent of other local government officials from across the state and the nation is there. Suzanne Potter reports. The group is focused on sharing what American cities and counties are doing to reduce greenhouse gases and learn best practices from around the world. Pam O'Connor is a former mayor of Santa Monica and vice chair of the group Local Governments for Sustainability. She says she's glad the U.S. is re-engaging on climate change after former President Donald Trump pulled the nation out of the Paris Agreement in 2019. The United States is back. States has plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 50 to 52 percent by 2030. We want to be a partner with our federal government in achieving that goal. O'Connor says California can serve as a model for other regions. Cities across the Golden State are greening their fleets of cars, buses, maintenance, and trash trucks. Many have started municipal power companies that provide electricity from renewable sources. And last year, Governor Gavin Newsom issued an executive order to phase out gas-powered vehicles. O'Connor says the leaders at the climate conference also need to keep equity in mind worldwide. We need to be working to ensure that countries that are not as developed are able to get the support and finance that they need to be able to grow in a way that is not building without any thought as to the impact on climate. On Tuesday, world leaders reached an agreement to limit deforestation. The conference will continue until next Friday. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. 
Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti tested positive for COVID-19 today while attending the UN Climate Conference. His office announced a positive test results in a tweet adding only he's feeling good and isolating in his hotel room and he is fully vaccinated. The climate summit is taking place at a time of very high coronavirus rates in the United Kingdom. The conference's United Nations organizers laid down rigid rules to guard against infection, including requiring each attendee to wear a mask and show daily proof of a negative result of a test to enter the venue each morning. Garcetti arrived Monday on a train with other mayors from around the world, including those from London, Paris, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and Freetown, Sierra Leone. President Joe Biden nominated Garcetti as ambassador to India, and Garcetti is awaiting confirmation in the Senate. Native American voices are among the indigenous voices speaking out at the Glasgow International Climate Crisis. Antonia Gonzalez reports. Jade Begay, director of Indian Collective's Climate Justice Campaign and a member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, spoke Tuesday. She was part of a roundtable on President Biden's Justice 40 initiative to advance environmental justice and spur economic opportunity for disadvantaged communities. President Biden's Justice 40 promise is to deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities. We're hoping that through Justice 40, um, the federal government really learns how to equitably channel resources directly to our frontline and indigenous communities. Um, and we can help. Uh, there was There's a prime example over the last uh, year with uh, the CARES funding that kicked in for indigenous communities during the pandemic. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a bottleneck that can happen in the process where uh, it takes a while for this federal funding to get invested into our communities and, and then to make its way directly to people. And so while that process is happening, NDN organizations like mine, we've stepped in to really channel uh, urgent and and, uh, quick resources to our people. The Indian Collective Delegation will participate in a number of events at the Climate Summit throughout the week. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. And we have to temporarily stop the news here for a moment. If we don't... We may have to permanently stop the news. That's because we need to raise the money to keep this newscast on the air. Indeed, to keep this radio station, KPFK, on the air in Southern California. And so, if you are listening in Southern California, if you are listening to KPFK in Los Angeles, you have three days left to come through with a financial commitment, a pledge, a donation, a contribution, a listener sponsorship to keep this radio station on the air as part of our fall fundraising drive, trying to raise enough money to keep this station operating further on towards the end of the year. We need to hear from you on the phone at 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-5735 or online at kpfk.org. This is Serious Business. This radio station is an independent voice for news and information and points of view and culture and music. But it's only an independent voice because it has an independent funding base. We do not get any federal money, state money, no religious money, no money from large corporations or rich individuals. We don't sell commercials. We don't auction ourselves off to corporations in the form of underwriting, like many public radio stations. 90% of our funding comes from you, the listeners. And that's what we're looking for right now. Your individual contribution to keep this independent, journalistic, broadcasting endeavor alive, which it is 
been able to do for nearly three quarters of a century. But that's because of your support. So give us a call, 818-985-5735, 818-985-5735, or do it online at kpfk.org, 818-985-5735, kpfk.org. The United States Supreme Court is poised to potentially overturn New York's century-old state law limiting concealed guns in public places. The high court heard a challenge to the law today in a case that could threaten gun control laws in at least six other states, including California. Christopher Martinez reports. In New York State, a 1913 law requires a permit in order to carry a concealed weapon outside the home for self-defense. To get that permit, a person must show a proper cause that they have a reason they need to defend themselves. Gun rights supporters are challenging that law, saying it's an infringement of a constitutional right. Lawyer Paul Clement argued the case for the plaintiffs. And at the end of the day, I think what it means to give somebody a constitutional right is that they don't have to satisfy a government official that they have a really good need to exercise it or they face atypical risks. Clement is representing the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, an affiliate of the NRA, as well as two gun owners in upstate New York who have gun permits to hunt, but not for concealed weapons in public spaces. Clement says the New York law turns a constitutional right into a privilege. That is not how constitutional rights work. Carrying a firearm outside the home is a fundamental constitutional right. It is not some extraordinary action that requires an extraordinary demonstration of need. Petitioners here seek nothing more than their fellow citizens in 43 other states already enjoy. Several states have gun permit laws similar to New York's, including California, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. But most other states are more permissive, having what are called May issue laws. The thrust of this case is, you know, we'd like what they're having. We'd like what the people in the other 43 states are allowed to do and exercise their rights. And in many of those states, it's shall issue. New York State's Solicitor General, Barbara Underwood, defended the state's law. She put it into the context of legal history and traditions. In total, from the founding era through the 20th century, at least 20 states have, at one time or another, either prohibited all carrying of handguns in populous areas or limited it to those with good cause. New York's law fits well within that tradition of regulating public carry. It makes a carry license available to any person, not disqualified, who has a non-speculative reason to carry a handgun for (coughs) self-defense. Federal Deputy Solicitor General Brian Fletcher also joined in defending the law. Several justices raised the issue of concealed weapons in sensitive places, like churches and schools. Justice Elena Kagan followed up on that point, asking Clement a question about universities. The Chief Justice started with universities, and you said that that would be all right. Did you mean that? Yes, I I, I did mean that. Because that's open for, you know, anybody can walk around the NYU campus. Well, NYU doesn't have much of a campus. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would go back to New York, and I think you'll find that that's wrong. New York's Underwood told the court it's easier to get permits in rural areas, but in dense urban areas, that's balanced with concerns about public safety. Chief Justice John Roberts questioned that. On the other hand, if the purpose of the Second Amendment is to allow people to protect themselves, that's implicated when you're in a high crime area. It's not implicated when you're out in the woods. Well, I, I'll, uh, I think it is implicated when you're out in the woods. It's just a different set of problems. I mean, you're, yeah, you're deserted there and you can't, and law enforcement is not available to come to your aid if something does happen. But, well, how many muggings take place in the forest? Um, if we, if we... Uh, how many do you think? <laughs> I don't know, but um, I will tell you that our licensing officer told us that rapes and and, uh, robberies happen on the deserted bike paths and that he has some concern. The court will issue its ruling by the summer. At this point, it looks like a majority of the court will vote to limit the New York law.
Meanwhile, gun control advocates will be watching closely. Former Arizona Congressmember Gabby Giffords became a gun control advocate after she suffered a brain injury in an assassination attempt. She joined a rally outside the courthouse. Words once came easily. Today I struggle to speak, but I have not lost my voice. America needs all us to speak out, even when you have to fight to find the words. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. Hey everyone, this is Brian edwards Teeker. And I'm Cad Brooks. Weekday mornings, we host Upfront. Two hours of conversation about what's in the news and what should be. Politics, technology. Prisons, police. What's happening in City Hall and at the State House. In Washington and in the streets. That's starting at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! On Upfront. Senate Republicans have once again blocked debate on voting rights legislation, this time the John Lewis Civil Rights Advancement Act. Today's action marks the fourth time the GOP has thwarted debate on the legislation to remove barriers to voting for underrepresented minorities. Sixty votes were needed in the Senate. Democrats only got 50. Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, the lone Republican to support even consideration of the Democratic initiative. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell called it unnecessary, framed the issue as a state's rights one. My friends on the other side trying to give Washington unprecedented power over how Americans cast their vote. We don't have time to do the NDAA or an appropriations process, but we always have time for a few more of these stunts. The bill aims to restore and strengthen parts of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that were struck down by a Supreme Court ruling in 2013. In Shelby County v. Holder, the High Court ruled the formulas for designating which states and regions have a history of discrimination against minority voters were unconstitutional, but did recommend that Congress create a new formula. The John Lewis Civil Rights Advancement Act would do that by modernizing anti-voter discrimination formulas. It would also require federal observers to be present at voting polls and require officials to give a 180-day notice for any voting changes in an election. Well, Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer from New York thanked Alaska Senator Murkowski for her bipartisan vote. He responded with extreme disappointment to her party's blocking debate on the legislation. Republicans once again obstructed the Senate from beginning its process. Given the chance to debate what is in, in what is supposed to be the world's greatest deliberative body, Republicans walked away. Today's obstruction was only the latest in a series of disturbing turns for the Republican Party. For over half a century, the policies of the Voting Rights Act have commanded bipartisan support in this chamber. It has been reauthorized five times, including by Presidents Nixon, Reagan, and Bush. Immediately after the vote, civil rights leaders from a variety of organizations such as the NAACP, the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, the Black Women's Roundtable, and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights held a press conference slamming Republicans for blocking the debate. Here's Wade Henderson, president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. It is devastating that a bill did not receive more Republican support. I would be remiss not to lift up the Alaska Federation of Natives, the Native American Rights Fund, and the National Congress of American Indians for their outreach to Senator Lisa Murkowski. It has now been eight years, four months, and nine days since the Supreme Court gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County versus Holder. The legislation should be coming back again since Senator Schumer voted no, allowing him to revive the bill again in the future.
Meanwhile, citing no incidents of election fraud, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis today pledged to create a law enforcement agency to investigate election crimes as part of a new state package of voting laws. Speaking at an event in West Palm Beach, the Republican governor announced a series of election law proposals for lawmakers to take up during next year's legislative session, including new restrictions on ballot drop boxes and strengthened penalties for ballot harvesting. DeSantis, who's up for re-election and is eyeing a 2024 presidential run, echoed many talking points on voting problems that have gained traction in the Republican Party following former President Donald Trump's false claims that his re-election was stolen from him. The governor has previously praised the 2020 election in Florida as smooth and there's widespread consensus among election officials and experts that there was no fraud that could have impacted results in the last presidential election. Still, without any evidence, DeSantis suggested issues at the ballot box. There will be people, if you see someone ballot harvesting, you know, what do you do if you call into the election office a lot of times they don't do anything if you know that there's you know in florida it's constitutionally mandated only citizens are allowed to vote in florida and yet you see examples of people they'll even check they're not citizens and they'll still be given ballots he said to applause DeSantis spoke broadly about the proposed election police force a news release from his office said the Office of Election Crimes and Security would be formed within the Department of State to investigate election crimes and fraud. President Joe Biden touted his administration's efforts to beat back the coronavirus today. He said infections are down, vaccinations up. As soon as next week, we'll have enough vaccine and enough places and parents will be able to schedule appointments to get their kids their first shot. And we've already secured enough vaccine supply for every single child in America, ages 5 through 11. And weeks ago, we asked states and pharmacies to put together their detailed plan to start placing their orders for these specially formulated vaccines for young children. We started packing and shipping these orders last week as soon as the FDA authorized the vaccine. We've already sent millions of doses, excuse me, <coughs> millions of doses and millions more to come by next week. His comments came a day after the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention approved Pfizer-BioNTech's kid-sized COVID-19 vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds. Biden says his administration has already sent out millions of the vaccines in anticipation of its approval. And his administration will roll out a nationwide children's vaccine program starting next week. Since early September, cases and hospitalizations are down now more than 50%. And over the past two weeks, cases and hospitalizations are falling in approximately 40 states. A year ago, we had no vaccines. Just this week, we hit an important milestone. 80% of adults have at least one shot. That's four out of every five adults. And for our seniors, over 95% have gotten at least one shot. Overall, 193 million Americans are fully vaccinated, up from just 2 million the day I was sworn in. KPFA's Lauren Shapiro has more. Since the onset of the pandemic, nearly 2 million children between the ages of 5 to 11 caught COVID-19. Over 8,000 of them were hospitalized due to complications associated with the virus, and at least 94 died. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky gave final approval of Pfizer-BioNTech's child-sized COVID-19 vaccine and says clinical trials show it's safe for children and 90% effective at preventing COVID-19 infection. We have followed the scientific pro process. We have done our due diligence. Please know we have thoroughly reviewed all of the available safety immunogenicity and efficacy data before recommending this vaccine for your child. In clinical trials, vaccination was found to be nearly 91% effective in preventing COVID-19 among children ages 5 to 11. In clinical trials, vaccine side effects were mild, 
self-limiting and similar to those seen in adults with other vaccines recommended for children. The most common side effect was a sore arm. She says the vaccine will do more than protect children against COVID-19, citing the adverse impacts the pandemic caused lockdowns have had on youth. She says the impacts have extended beyond physical health to mental and social well-being, domains in which the vaccine could improve outcomes as well. There are children in the second grade who've never experienced a normal school year. There are students in middle school who missed out on school sports and extracurricular activities. There are missed proms and homecomings and too many missed graduations. We have watched as the education gaps that exist in this country have widened as this virus has disproportionately impacted racial and ethnic minority communities. And we have seen the negative impact on the mental health of our youth. We are reminded of the importance of providing children with an environment where they can succeed. Pediatric vaccination has the power to help us achieve healthy, safe, and inclusive environments for our children. Millions of child-sized doses of the vaccine are on their way to clinics, pharmacies, and doctor's offices. More will be shipped within the next 24 hours. White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Jeff Zients says the vaccine rollout effort involves coordination among state, local health departments, and schools, as well as community-based clinic sites, such as at youth sporting events, churches, and museums. State and local health departments are planning to launch thousands of community-based clinics, including at youth sporting events, fairs, zoos, and community centers. And across the country, schools will partner with vaccine providers to host vaccination clinics, with more than 6,000 clinics at schools being planned before the winter holiday break. Later today, we'll be meeting with governor's offices, state and local health departments, community health centers, and pharmacies as they stand up their vaccination operations. All together, starting next week, parents will have approximately 20,000 trusted and convenient locations to get their kids vaccinated. Scheduling systems for booking appointments to vaccinate 5 to 11 year olds at CVS and Walgreens are now open. And the Northern California branch of Kaiser opens for child COVID-19 vaccines Thursday. Kaiser says it plans to begin administering vaccines throughout its system on Monday. Parents can search for vaccine administration sites near them by visiting www.vaccines.gov. The list is expected to be finalized by week's end. Reporting for KPFA News, I'm Lauren Shapiro. Facebook says it's removed a post by Ethiopia's prime minister that urged citizens to rise up and bury the rival Tigray forces who now threaten the capital as the country's war reaches the one-year mark. A spokeswoman said that Prime Minister Abi Ahmed's post on Sunday violated the platform's policies against inciting and supporting violence. The spreading conflict comes as the United Nations condemned possible war crimes uncovered in a joint investigation into the bloody year-long war in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region. Colette Wanjohi reports from Addis Ababa. The report findings suggest that all parties to the conflict have committed violations of international human rights, some of which may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The report has been released as the conflict in the north marks a year since it began, with rebels threatening to enter the capital Addis Ababa. Coleto Anjohi in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Alameda County Supervisor Wilma Chan was killed this afternoon when a car struck her when she was walking her dog in Alameda. Chan was hit while crossing the street, incurring a serious head injury. She was taken to Highland Hospital where doctors pronounced her dead at 2.30 in the afternoon. Chan was elected to the Alameda County Board of Supervisors in 1994 and later served on the State Assembly from 2000 to 2006, where she was the first Asian American Assembly Majority Leader. Wilma Chan, dead at the age of 72. Rain tonight in the San Francisco Bay Area. 15% chance of rain tomorrow after morning clouds and afternoon sun with highs in the mid-60s to the upper 60s. Partly cloudy in the central San Joaquin Valley. Highs from the low to the mid-70s. Partly cloudy. Tune in Wednesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Bay Native Circle. Bringing you today's native issues, people, culture, and events with weekly rotating hosts. 
Then at 8 p.m., it's Dead to the World with Tim Lynch, featuring the music of the Grateful Dead, the music it's influenced and influenced by. And the night at 10 p.m. with Sing Out, a showcase of the world's ever-changing music realm, hosted by Larry Kelp. That's Wednesday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Stop, 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 stop. 